Um, so, go. Well, I want to welcome everyone. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our new series. Uh, for those of us and lots of familiar faces uh, that remember this is the Stewardship Town Hall for 2022. Uh, for those that didn't join us for the first one around family wellness, this is uh, a new series, Equipping Enriching Parish Life. So we're going to uh, go a little bit wider than simply just stewardship, um, but we're gonna cover additional topics from our other metropolis ministries. Uh, today, we're, we're gonna go back to our roots a little bit and, and stay on some stewardship topics. And we're actually gonna do two dual topics today. Uh, Kristen, uh, who we all love and know as someone who makes these things happen, is actually going to be a presenter tonight. So Kristen will be in the, the role of presenter and we'll try to try to keep everything else on, on track. Um, and she's going to talk about giving thanks and an attitude of gratitude. And that was of great interest uh, last year as we polled everyone at the end of the year. I think this was a topic that, that certainly uh, we wanted to get into a little bit deeper. So really looking forward to not only Kristen's presentation, but even the discussion um, that we'll have ourselves together. And as always, we want this to be interactive. We want to hear, we want to share experiences um, and really, again, for the benefit of being able to strengthen all of our parishes. Um, and then Bill's going to be joining us a, a little bit later. So Bill Marianas, uh, who we all know uh, and love very much, is going to join us later and talk about another topic that came up uh, late last year which is around tithing. So getting on the road to tithing and percentage giving. Um, and we've heard a little bit of that in this, in this five-part series for those that, are part, that participate in the five-part series. Of course, last year through the stewardship town halls, and uh, maybe we can go even a little bit deeper. Um, and now that we're all blessed to see our, our fellow parishioners and come together, it's a beautiful time. Uh, we've all been on this Zoom, these Zooms and you know, wondering when the day would, would arrive. And uh, I think for many of us, we, we get to enjoy it. And certainly Pascha and Holy Week this week uh, was a, just a, a beautiful reminder of that. So, so with that, before we uh, turn it over to Kristen, I wanted to ask Father Dean to bless us with an opening prayer and we can get started this evening. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Let's, uh, let's start by chanting um, Christos Anesti and then we'll follow up with a prayer. Christos anesti ek nekron, thanatos thanaton pa, tisas ketisen dismasi, zoin harisamenu. Lord Jesus Christ, and of God, as we continue to celebrate the joy of your holy resurrection, as you transform death to life, through the power and grace of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you continue to transform us, that we may grow in our faith and love in you through the ministries of stewardship, the ministry of gratitude and thankfulness as we seek in faith and love to glorify you, O Lord, in all that we do for now and into eternity. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Dean. You're welcome. I wanted to remind everyone, you the default has been on mute. Um, I encourage, we encourage you, if you've got a question or want to share an experience, please come off of mute. Uh, feel free to also use the chat channel. Um, I'll keep monitoring the chat channel. So if you don't want to interrupt the speakers, uh, you, can, you can put a question or, or pose um, anything in the chat and we'll keep, keep track of that. Um, and again, once we get to the Q&A, what we'll try to do is after Kristen presents, we'll try to take a a little bit of a, a pause and break there and, and open it up for Q&A. And then uh, uh, we'll continue with our second topic uh, around tithing and percentage giving once Bill is able to join us. So Father Timothy, great to see you. Thank you for joining. Um, and uh, actually Father Athanasios has also joined us. So wonderful. Um, Kristen, if you're ready, we're I looking forward. I am ready.
So first of all, because I can't see all of you, let me change this here. Got a thumbs up. Can you see the screen? We can. Okay, yep. perfect. I just want to minimize that so I can not have that in the way. So thank you all for being here. And once again, Christos Anesti, Christ is risen. It is a wonderful opportunity that I give thanks for to be able to share with you some of my ideas and experiences as they relate to this important aspect of stewardship, giving thanks. Um, as Steve mentioned, please feel free to add questions into the chat, which I am happy to address at the end of this session. I also wanted to let you know that uh, this is being recorded and uh, the PowerPoint presentation that you will be seeing will be available online and the recording. So don't feel that you have to take fast and furious notes. This will be available for your viewing and downloading pleasure at, uh, in about a week. Just give me a few days to catch up on some things, um, but we will post this and any of the handouts that Bill Marianas will have for his section as well. So without any further ado, I will move on to the bulk of my presentation which starts with the Eucharist. This is the prime example that we have of giving thanks. This is where it all begins. It is the Feast of Feasts. It is the Royal Banquet. And this is where we start with giving thanks to God for the gift of eternal life that he has given us through his body and blood. So every Sunday, every time that you are at liturgy, and you see the chalice, the word Eucharist, Eucharistia. And so that is where we are giving thanks. So just keep your eye on that prize because that's where this is all centered from. We talk a lot about prayer and we know that in the Bible, it says pray without ceasing. The reality is our schedules are busy. We have work, we have families, we have Zooms. How many Zooms? Too many Zooms. But prayer is something that needs to be prioritized in our lives, both as individuals and as families. What should we pray for? God knows what we need. This is where the attitude of gratitude begins. It is with prayer. Every prayer should start out by giving thanks to God for his blessings and then let your heart speak from there. Again, this is where the attitude of gratitude begins. So how do we unlock the door of gratitude? Well, this is the magic key. It is simply developing a comprehensive strategy to say thank you to your stewards. How can we show that gratitude? So many ways, some very obvious, some maybe not. We talk about formal letters, emails, phone calls, video messages, handwritten notes. And yes, people still do handwritten notes and never underestimate how important those are and how much people really appreciate receiving those. Of course, you're going to do a formal thank you letter, especially if there is a special initiative for a donation. And you want to make sure that that is sent in a timely manner, really no more than one week after that donation is received. Some of you may also be familiar with the rule of seven. They ask in the fundraising world, I've been in nonprofit fundraising and marketing since 1990. So this is now a year 32, I guess. And uh, the rule of seven is something that has been around long before I entered nonprofit management. And they say that if somebody makes a gift to your organization, they should be thanked seven times. So what does that mean? You send them seven letters? No, nobody wants, nobody wants seven letters. But if somebody's doing something really exceptional and it doesn't necessarily have to be monetary, they might, you might want somebody to pick up the phone, maybe your parish council president or your priest to pick up the phone and say, I just wanted to thank you. They're going to get a formal letter. Maybe they're going to get an email. And now we, we have the benefit of these lovely devices that we carry in our hands. You have the opportunity to send a little video message or a handwritten note. 
There are so many ways that you can engage with your donors and your stewards. So let the sky be the limit. Be creative, be consistent, especially be timely in, don in acknowledging your donors. So who should be thanked? Well, guess what? It's everyone. It's everyone. Every person is doing something worthy of recognition. The more inclusive, the better. So just remember that. It's, again, it's not just about people's monetary contributions. It's about recognizing them and their involvement in your parish. So what are you thanking them for? We just said everyone should be thanked. Well, what should, be, what should they be thanked for? Pretty much anything and everything. But you shouldn't go out and contrive opportunities to acknowledge your donors and stewards. But there are probably more ways than you think. We talk about our stewards. You want to thank them not just for their financial contributions, but we also need to show that we value their time and their talent. We always talk about the three T's, time, talent, treasure, time, talent, treasure. However, when we talk about stewardship, many times time and talent get kind of brushed over and we focus on treasure. We can't underestimate that we need time and talent. We need the physical gifts and the labors of our stewards to help bring the full ministry of the parish to life. What about your volunteers? Maybe somebody that heads up baking for the festival or the person who organizes the kolivan, the prospero for your church. What about making sure that somebody says thank you to them once in a while? Don't just assume that that's always going to be there. It's just these small little things that do create the attitude of gratitude. What about your ministry leaders? At the end of the year, sending a small little thank you note from the priest and the parish council president, maybe they, they co-sign a letter just to thank them. Thank the Sunday school teachers and say, you know, thank you for the time that you are offering to help guide our children and instruct them in the faith. The people that are greeting in the narthex, and again, we don't want this to go overboard, but we have to recognize what people are doing because showing our appreciation for our volunteers and our stewards in the variety of ways that they serve Christ and the church encourages their deeper commitment and hopefully inspires others to similar service and stewardship. So. What is the common message? It's really simple. We appreciate you and we give thanks to God for you. Yes, we appreciate their financial contributions, but we appreciate them as our brothers and sisters in Christ and as part of our church family. I love this scripture that's on the left of the screen from Thessalonians. I thank God for you, your work of faith and labor of love. Keep that in mind. And that's a great scripture verse to use if you are also writing a more formal letter um, that is really meaningful to stewards when you're thanking them. The other thing that's important is making sure that people know what your progress is. Celebrate milestones and benchmarks. We had a beautiful Holy Week in Pascha. It was so nice to see people back in church. Thank you for your stewardship. It doesn't have to be an, an individual letter to individual people. It could be a message in a bulletin. It could be a special email blast that goes out to the community, whether or not it's after a Greek festival, after a fundraising event, after a, a parish feast day but making sure that people know that they as stewards are making a difference and that they are making progress possible in the church 
And that progress is not necessarily fixing a leaky roof or repaving a parking lot or painting the church or renovating something. The progress has to do with furthering the work of the gospel. So this ties into the previous slide. Show them that their gifts are making a positive difference. Don't beat the dead horse is what I love to say. Don't make stewardship about what the church needs. Again, the new roof, the repaired this, the broken that. Make stewardship about giving back to God what is already his. Make stewardship about giving glory to God for his blessings. People like to see growth. They respond to sincerity and they like to feel appreciated. And when you do, you get a beautiful daisy that grows out of your little graph. So who should be initiating the thank you process? Well, the one that is not on this list is your office staff. That's a given. And most of our parishes, not all, but many of our parishes, most of our parishes do have people that are running the office administratively, and they are the ones that might be processing contributions either for stewardship and other, um, other initiatives. But in terms of these other thank yous, who should be initiating them? Our clergy, our parish council, our ministry leaders. Your Sunday school director should be thanking their teachers. Your altar boy leaders should be thanking the altar boys, even if it's a group email to all the altar boys for their wonderful and prayerful service during Holy Week, or to your chanters or your choir, making sure that people know that we recognize what they are doing is important to stewardship. And it's also important to teach your youth to say thank you from an early age. There are ways that you can get your kids in your youth ministry programs involved in that, whether or not they're thanking their dance teacher or their Goya advisor or their altar boy leader. There are ways that the youth can learn to say thank you. They could even, as a project in their youth ministry programs or even in Sunday school, they could create handwritten thank you notes, not addressed to anyone, but something that says thank you to our stewards. And those could be sent out to people. And this might be a thank you from the fourth grade Sunday school class or from the eighth grade or the high school students. Make sure that the kids understand why it is important to say thank you. So when it comes to contributions, keeping accurate records is so important. And I know that we deal with this at our parishes. We deal with this at the metropolis. Every nonprofit deals with this. Making sure that your data is correct is crucial because people want to know that their donations are being properly reported and that they are being properly stewarded. Now, uh, the stewardship chairman who does an incredible job for my parish, Sandy Maris, is on this call and she knows how I feel about this. Uh, providing detail to your donors, especially on your stewardship statements. Don't just show them a lump sum that they've given for the past quarter or six months. People need to see where those gaps might be in their giving, which may motivate them to catch up. If you just give them a total amount that they have given thus far, maybe they're gonna forget, oh yeah, I missed a couple of Sundays in church. And maybe they're not all signed up for online giving yet. And so that is important for people to be able to see when they gave. The other thing is your stewardship statements should not look like a bill. It shouldn't, um, it shouldn't show like the amount you owe you would never want to use terminology like that. You might want to say something like the amount remaining to fulfill your pledge. You also need to make sure your stewardship statements say thank you. 
very simple. They need to say thank you. Even if there's an enclosed letter, if the process that you use or the software that you use can't be customized, make sure it says thank you. And also be sure that the important footnote that I have here on the screen should be at the bottom of all donation letters and at the bottom of your donation statements. In accordance with IRS regulations, insert your parish name, affirms that no goods or services were received in exchange for this gift. That is very important for people to have because that is what is needed for them to claim the deduction for tax purposes. So we talked before about who should initiate the thank you process. We talked about the clergy and the parish council, the ministry leaders. Well, what about the congregation? Why should everybody else be doing the work but not the congregation? So maybe what you might want to consider is having a process where you encourage the congregation to recognize people for something that they did. I've heard programs like this called um, give backs or backstroke, you know, like you're patting somebody on the back. Maybe you want to uh, thank somebody because they are always there to open the door and greet you when you come to church on Sunday morning, or you see them assisting elderly parishioners. You want to thank somebody for having a positive attitude, getting the congregation involved and letting people know that as a family, we recognize what other people are doing. Maybe it's someone that goes around at coffee hour without even being asked, and they go around and they clear the tables. We all know we have been involved in the church. It is the same. I don't care if you're in Phoenix where I am, or if you're in Seattle or Hawaii or Alaska. When it comes to cleaning up after a church event, you will never see people scatter fast enough. I mean, poof, they're gone, and there's two people left to clean up but you always have those good and faithful people that stick around and do that. Let's make sure that somebody recognizes that and say, you know what? I just want you to know, I see that you do that. And I just, I appreciate that you've taken that upon yourselves to do. Church members give more generously of their gifts to churches that are growing spiritually. If we are really doing things the right way, our parishes wouldn't need to ask for money. If someone is being nurtured and fulfilled spiritually, their hearts will be open and they will give their first fruits back to God. Now, that's a tall order and we have wonderful clergy. We are so blessed with the clergy in our metropolis and certainly with the leadership and encouragement of His Eminence Metropolitan Yerasimos. But this is, where, this is where it is. And it goes back to that first slide about the Eucharist. This is where, this is, this is the food. This is the spiritual food that we have to start with. This isn't again about, we need you to give money because the roof is gonna leak, or we need you to give money because this is gonna happen or the paint is peeling. We need people to give because they love the Lord. And it's a demonstration of their faith in action through stewardship. So why should people give? It's theological. The icon on the left is the Last Supper. This was Christ's gift to us, the Eucharist. He gave us his body and his blood for forgiveness of our sins and for eternal life. It's biblical. God loves a cheerful giver each one to give according to what is in his heart. Again, tying back to being spiritually fulfilled. And lastly, and most important, we give because Christ gave himself for us on the cross. We all just witnessed that during Holy Week. There is nothing more beautiful than that Holy Thursday service during the procession and knowing that Christ carried that cross and was lifted up on that cross. And by doing that, he lifted all of us up. That is what stewardship is about. So 
asking people to give is important. You need to encourage people. You have to sign a pledge card. It is part of who we are. It is part of our life as Orthodox Christians and to be stewards in good standing and to really take advantage of all that our parishes offer. We need to remember to say thank you. A quick email, a postcard, even when somebody completes their pledge card, just to acknowledge, thank you so much for signing your 2022 pledge card. We are so grateful to have you as part of our parish family. We look forward to seeing you in church on Sunday. Make people aware that you know they are giving. How much they are giving, that's not important. What is most important is that they are recognized that they are stewards and making sure that you always say thank you. Many languages, sometimes one word, sometimes two words, sometimes many more words depending on the language, but at the end of the day, the message is thank you. And that concludes my presentation. Fantastic. I, thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions, anything. I don't know what came up in the chat, but uh, Steve, let me know if there's anything that I can add in or clarify. I, I definitely will. We, we've got some questions and, uh, or at least I've got a question or two. And uh, hopefully some of the folks that have been chatting with me directly are, are, are uh, willing and ready to provide some of the experiences at their own parishes and how they're going about uh, showing the attitude of gratitude. But uh, absolutely, Chris, and thank you. I, I you know, I'm always inspired um, on, on so many different fronts, but, you know, I, I will share at least you know personally the the children writing thank you notes uh just the the power of that both giver and receiver um teaching our, our youth and children to this attitude of gratitude and nothing would touch me more i know than to receive that from someone you know the, the ability to to know that our gifts are helping you know perpetuate our, our faith and and then and you know bringing it to our youth so so I love that. I love that that uh, that idea. Um, let's see. We do have a question uh, that came in, and we'll certainly open it up. So others that would like to also ask a question, feel free to come off of mute. But um, a question that came in early. This is. Let's see if I can try to summarize this a little bit. Um, it, it deals with you know providing thank you for stewardship. Um, and in, in many cases, uh, the, the priest could do it, but of course, our, 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 our priests have so much to do. Um, let's see, if, if they receive a thank you note from anyone else, let's say a parish council president or a stewardship committee chair or a stewardship uh, committee member, um, some people may be offended um, if the note sort of accompanies the statement. Uh, so this goes back into the issue of um, you know, knowing, and I know Bill joined us early too, so Bill may have a perspective on this too, but, um, you know, some parishes, um, I know even in my home parish, we keep that very confidential information. It's really between the giver and um, a, a very small group, maybe a stewardship chair or people that need to know and then the priest, mm -hmm. but um, how, how would you best handle that, uh, this individual um, was asking about it with the archdiocese has standards. I don't believe the archdiocese has any uh, stated standards around this, but this is really kind of the culture and the practice of the parish. So Kristen, I don't know if you have uh, some thoughts there. And, and, you know, again, I think Bill would too. Well, I don't, I don't think that sending someone a thank you, a thank you note for being a steward implies that you're going to know how much they give. And if somebody is giving to a special initiative because they're, there's, you know, a, you know they're, they're sponsoring something or they're making a, a donation specific to something, then that's usually more public, but it would be on a need to know basis. And those people that, that do know, be the priest, parish council president perhaps, or the stewardship chair, but a, a thank you from a Sunday school student 
does not imply that that person knows how much somebody gives. It's just thanking them for being a steward or thanking them for their time. Because the money, I think the money will come if people are thanked. And I know Bill Navardis is on here, my partner in crime as a fellow development director. Hi, sweet Bill. But um, I think that's where people, um, that's where we really need to focus that effort. But I don't think, I don't think we have to, we don't have to divulge anything regarding the level of people's giving and thanking people for being a steward. I think that that statement in and of itself can be freestanding. Yep, independent of, of any uh, particular numbers. Yeah. Bill, did you have anything to add to that? You're on mute. You're talking to me or Marianas? No, sorry, you know what? Uh, well, Bill actually, <laughs> and I read this if you do also, but Bill Marianas. Uh, let me defer to the other Bill and I'll jump in later. Go ahead, Bill. So um, when Bill Marianas came and spoke at our church years ago, um, he said something that I remembered. Um, if they, if you have their watch, you'll get their wallet. The money will come. Kristen said that, and she's absolutely right. I've been doing fundraising 22 years. The money will come. You know, um, if you have their time, their most precious commodity, they will give. They will give. And I want to thank the priest on this call because I wish you would have more priests on these calls because Kristen and her group do a phenomenal job. And um, it takes more than just a priest, though. Um, I write thank you letters when people give donations to Goya, because I'm the Goya director. And I write personal thank you letters. And when I see them, they say thank you for that thank you letter. So people want, you know, you can never, ever thank people enough. And, and let's, uh, I'd rather hear from the, from the other bill now. No, I, I would ditto that. I mean, I, to the point that you all said earlier, and Steve, you just gave a good example. One of the one of the ministries that I just featured just recently on the, on the H Faith Radio program is that the, the ministry that works with autistic kids, Love Michael. And if you ever order anything from them, whatever product you get, there will always be a personal note from one of the autistic young men or young women that was involved, whether it's picking, packing or otherwise. And I don't care. I mean, how good the product is, is great, whatever the case may be. But just that personal note and realizing that there's now a human connection, because this is the thing that Kristen was referring to that we, we, that we sometimes miss is there's a divine connection and there's a human connection. And we have to be remind, we have to be reminding people of both the divine and the human aspect of it. And the more we can do that, the more ways we can do that, the more interfaces that we can do that is just fine. Yes, they'll get one letter from the person who has access to the dollar amount who will give them the tax letter that they need to give and that's fine. But everybody else just thanking them and thanking them for whatever generosity they have in their heart, you can never, as Bill said, you and Kim Kristen said, you can never thank too much. Excellent, great. Um, we actually, Fula, if I can call on you, um, yes. you yes. know, I think talking a little bit about what what uh, you've been doing, you know, what the Annunciation Parish in San Francisco does. Uh, I'll share with you that you know my son who came up to San Francisco and uh, early the, earlier this year has enjoyed and felt very comfortable um, there at Annunciation. So we're yeah. to talk a little bit about. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> and also um, I'm. Uh, colleague of Kristen's, very proud of her and all that she does and uh, for the last, what, 13 years. <clears throat> but I wanted to say regarding um, on Sundays and when we come and meet different people, we see people, of course, that we know, but uh, I know I take part, so is President Dada, my colleague here, <clears throat> uh, greeting people that we haven't seen, we don't know who they are, we welcome them and, and it's such a great feeling because we embrace them and bring them into our community and, uh, you know, help network. Like I had this one lady come and, and she wants to, you know, network with different people. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. You know, we do, you know, go towards the people that we know and try to catch up. But it's important when we see strangers, I don't like to use that word, but new people to our church to um, embrace them and make them feel at home. So. I've been on parish council. I'm in the choir and fill up the house and uh, just, uh, yeah, basically that's it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Pula. Uh, are there other questions that the group has regarding Kristen's presentation? And if we don't right now, we will uh, kind of hit chapter two for the evening. Uh, so we have Bill who's able to, to join us um, 
And again, on the topic of tithing and percentage giving, um, if there are questions uh, later on that uh, come up, even on our giving thanks, uh, we can certainly address them after Bill's presentation. Thanks, David. Thanks, Kristen. And sorry, I was a little bit late, but I'm moving through the time zones of the United States. And so I'm blessed to finally be in the preferred time zone, right? Um, but I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk about what I think is one of my favorite topics and perhaps one of the biggest challenges. And hopefully, if all the sharing and splitting of screens has worked, you're seeing the tithing and percentage giving uh, screen uh, shot here. And uh, hopefully, what's now on the screen is the one that shows you that this entire deck has already been uploaded on my website. And as soon as I send it to Kristen, it will be uploaded on the Metropolis of San Francisco website. But, it, but you know, I've maintained the Metropolis of San Francisco pages on my pa uh, website under stewardship. And if you go down there, you can already download this, this entire deck. Um, I'm gonna go through some of this quickly because we've been through some of this before, but I want you to spend some, uh, spend some time on it as, as much time as you need. So just go to Stewardship Calling, the Stewardship tab, and you'll see the Metropolis of San Francisco. All the presentations we have ever done together are on the Metropolis website. They're on my website. The videos are there as soon as Kristen sends me the video goes, but this PowerPoint's already there. Y you know, I can't do a presentation without asking you the why question, kind of, because because that's what I am. I'm the why guy, right? So in, in really understanding why are we here, and, and this is not just a, a, a theoretical question. This is a this is truly a, a, a critical question for our own life and our own journey and our own salvific uh, process that we're undertaking. Uh, those of you who've been through my presentations know before that I tend to focus my attention on the passage from the Divine Liturgy in 2 Corinthians 5.10 where we focus on that moment when we're going to stand before the awesome judgment seat of Christ and, and have an opportunity to account. And so as we start to reflect on our why, on the purpose for our existence, we can start to think about how every step we take, every journey we take, every piece of stewardship we do, whether it's to love someone or thank someone, as Christian just said, or, or to support someone, is actually moving us towards that, that good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. You know that the the question that I always fret about our Lord asking us in terms of one of the most difficult questions regarding our generosity is what did we do for his church and his people under our watch, given all the gifts that he gave us? I think if he were to ask every one of us, what did you do with my church and my people under your watch, given all the gifts that I gave you? I hope that you will feel that sense of challenge that, that I and others feel in this regard, because really everything we have is God's gift. And so if we are called to give of ourselves freely, just as Kristen said, our Lord and Savior did, just as we celebrated through the Paschal journey, then this is a, a wonderful opportunity. Now, now, how do we go about doing that? Because really what we're trying to do is figure out a way to become better stewards of Christ's church. And if you, if you understand the concept of the word steward, steward, steward there's lots of debate about the origin of the word steward, right? I mean, my favorite one is there's a, a, a UK uh, a definition from the old ancient English where the steward it derived from the word sty warden because that the steward was the one that took care of the pigsty. Now, now, nobody get offended with me over here because back in those days, that livestock was one of the most valuable assets that the homeowners had. So to be charged with the stewardship over that important livestock was actually a high privilege, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about definitions of stewards. But as we start to really drill down on this notions of percentage giving and tithing, which I think is the secret sauce, it's the secret ingredient. When people say, if you got a magic trick, what's the one thing that we could do that would make a difference? I will tell you this is it. But it leads to a really important question. Why do Orthodox Christians pray, but Orthodox Christians generally don't tithe? Why do they pray, but why don't we tithe? And if you step back and think about it for a while, who first taught you how to pray? Maybe it was your Yaya. I, I saw on the, on the list of people that are, that are watching tonight, Steve, somebody's name is Yaya. So Yaya, maybe you were the one that taught us how to pray. Maybe it was your father, or your mother, or your, or your sibling, or your cousin, or, or, or your godparents and stuff like that. Hopefully, it was your priest, or your Sunday school teacher, or if you were, if you're an altar boy, if you were a mio fore, if you were an inquirer. But somebody taught you, or told you, or encouraged you how to pray. And so, 
while we may not do it great or we may not be excellent at it, we've had guidance, we've had instruction on the importance of praying. We have homilies on the importance of praying. We have, we have stories about the importance of praying. Well, who taught you how to tithe? In fact, did anybody ever use the word tithe when you were growing up? And the reality, unfortunately, in the orthosphere is it we have not had that conversation. Now, by the grace of God, those wonderful converts that come to our church from other traditions that were tithing traditions, I mean, they just, they get it naturally. I you probably heard me tell the joke about the, the, and this is a true story. It's not just a joke. This Baptist guy who got married in the Orthodox church, and we were talking about stewardship, and he said, yeah, becoming Orthodox was the best financial decision I ever made. I mean, you know, he went from a Baptist tradition, which was teaching the tithe to one which doesn't even use the word. So if we really want to understand the root cause of why is it that we don't embrace percentage giving and tithing, the answer is we haven't taught it. We haven't educated it. We haven't reinforced it. It's just, it's been kind of that thing we don't talk about. It's kind of like that crazy Uncle Spiro that, you know, nobody really talks about. And I apologize for all the Spiros on the call here. So the, 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 the point here is that you don't do what you never learned to do. You just don't do what you never learned to do. And if you haven't been taught, if you haven't been trained, if you haven't been encouraged to be a true steward, to be a tither, to be a percentage giver, then there's no wonder why we don't do, why we don't have that, why that isn't a phenomenon within the Orthodox Church. And so I'm challenging everybody on this call tonight or anybody that watches this video later, what have you done to teach your loved ones about stewardship? And specifically, because that's the topic I want to talk about tonight, tithing and percentage giving. I, I, I want to basically deputize everybody on the call tonight to become the disciple of percentage giving, to become the apostle of tithing, and to go and make apostles and disciples and tithers of all Orthodox nations. So let's go back to that definition, because I know some of you were offended when I accused you of taking care of the pigsties of, of old England and whatnot. So when we start to think about who a steward is and why this all fits within the context of tithing and percentage giving, a steward, by definition, is a temporary caretaker for another. But brothers and sisters, as I've often said, you will never see a, a hearse followed by a U-Haul trailer. You're leaving it all behind. Right now, the resources you have, the money you have, everything you have, you are a temporary caretaker of it. Someone will have it after you. But they give joyfully with a heart of gratitude, not begrudgingly, not because somebody twisted their arm or told them we have a budget to meet. That doesn't, that's not a steward. That's somebody that's, that's paying bills. They never use the phrase their money because they realize they are a temporary caretaker of somebody else's money. And even the, the fact that they made the money, they did the work, they, they generated the income, the reality of it, it was God's gift and the gift of others, their parents, their grandparents who inspired them, who encouraged them, who promoted them to be able to do it. It's not their money. So stop thinking about it as yours. They don't expect recognition or benefit because again, there's no reason for that. That's God's grace. The only regret they have and the, well, you'll know when you're a steward, my brothers and sisters, trust me in this, you will know when you're a steward, when you generously give, and instead of just celebrating your own accomplishment, you go, you know, I bet I could have done something more. I bet I could have done something different. I bet I could have helped somebody else. And that will be an inspiration. It's not a criticism. It's not a, it's not a negative. It's an inspiration to take that next level. They give their first fruits and before anything else. That's what a steward is. And they give proportionate to their blessings. We're going to talk scripture in a second. And they view their giving as a walk of discipleship with Christ. It's not an act. It's not an activity. It's not a bill to pay. It is an act of discipleship in Christ. Every time you give a gift, including the gift that you're giving tonight to us of your time, and whatever you take from tonight that you apply is a giving a gift. That is a part of the walk of your discipleship with Christ so that when you stand before the awesome judgment seat of Christ, you will be able to tell with good accounting what you've done. Now. You know that I like acronyms because I can't remember squat. So my acronym, the life-changing acronym, the one that I think makes all the difference in the world, the one I hope you will embrace is NEIG. I hope that you will, for, I hope that some of you will embrace this so much that you get tattoos that say NEIG on you because that's how important this is. When you can fully embrace the life of NEIG, then everything else will be great in the journey towards theosis. The acronym is real simple. It's not yours, it's God's. It's not yours, it's God's. Everything you have, everything you have 
is a gift to you from your creator, a most amazing gift from your creator. And as, as we learn in the Gospel of Matthew that none of us, none of us paid for the gifts that we have been given, the talents, the abilities, the families, the resources. The, I mean, maybe we paid for our education. Some of you may regret paying for your education. But the point is that all of this was a gift, a gracious gift from your creator. And so now you have the opportunity to give without expecting pay in return. Now, I'm pleased to present for the first time ever, I don't think he's on, his eminence is not on at this moment, right? I don't think so, good. Because I'm presenting the new Metropolis of San Francisco stewardship card. I've taken the liberty of designing a new stewardship card, Steve, for all of the parishes in the Metropolis of San Francisco. And it's the, it's the Matthew 19 stewardship card. We're gonna have a nice picture of his eminence in there. Only two things. The, the first thing is step one, write down how much money you make. And the second step is send it all to your church. This is it. I'm telling you folks, it doesn't have to be more complicated than this. This is how much do you make? Send it all to your church. Thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation for tonight and forever. And, and before, you, before you laugh too hard, we're going to spend in a few slides a, a little walk through Matthew 19, verses 16 through 26. You'll know it as the parable of the rich young man. And what you'll find out is that my stewardship card, which I freely give you the copyright to, is exactly what our Lord taught in the parable of the rich young man. But here's the problem. The problem is, remember I said we've been teaching prayer, but we ain't been teaching percentage giving. What have we been teaching? What are the bad habits we've gotten into? Well, we've been getting into the bad habits of dues in the old days, and in some parishes still, and disguised dues as the poor cousin of dues. These are minimums or suggested donations. They're donations that are based on age or some demographic status, as if that has anything to do with the first fruits message. They're perks that are given to family members, like if you pay this, you get a reduction in our rental hall. Or their family plans, because after all, I'm fully expecting that when I'm standing before the awesome judgment seat of Christ and have to account for all of my many sins, I'm going to be able to attach myself to all the wonderful things my wife has done and get a passage into heaven. No, it doesn't work that way either. Dues that are set based on a budget. <laughs> Folks, I, I don't mean to be fun. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but, but I know how Greek Orthodox Church prepare their budgets, right? This is what y'all do. You took last year's budget and you tweaked a few numbers. And last year, you took the previous year's numbers, and you've tweaked a few numbers. And then the previous year, you took the previous years, and you tweaked a few numbers, which means that the only budget that has ever been created in your parish was the very first budget that some old person created, and y'all have been compounding the felony ever since then. There is nothing about that budgeting process that is a righteous spiritual church-based budgeting process. So to create an idea that we have met our obligation to God merely by paying some random amount is just folly. And this, I, I, the newest technique is the pay a day of church expenses, because that's what this is all about. We're just here about paying expenses. The bottom line is, folks, anything other than the tithe and true percentage proportional giving is dues. It's disguised dues. So don't tell me you have stewardship until you tell me that you have created a culture of percentage giving on your way to being tithed, because everything else is just a, a euphemism for some current form of dues. Now, why is that a problem? What's the problem with dues? Well, if you look at a dictionary definition of dues, it's charges for membership in a club or an organization. Look, you all pay dues for any number of things. Maybe it's a club or a, a trade association or your golf club or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, we're used to paying dues for stuff, right? But Christ didn't teach anything about that. I challenge you. I beg you to find a scriptural example where our Lord and Savior said, that's the way we should do things. You're not going to find it. In fact, the two things that you will find that really stand out, you'll find it, it has been reported often, and I think it's true that, that, that our Lord and Savior talked more about money and giving than just about any other topic you can imagine, not because he was, not because he was uh, angry about those kinds of things. I mean, he was throwing the, the, the money changers out of the temples. But the two that I cite over and over again is the one I alluded to earlier in the New Metropolitan uh, Yerasimus Pledge Card. It's the parable of the rich young man. You remember that? The young man comes to the Lord and says, great question kid was focused. He said, what good deed must I do to lay hold on eternal life? Kid was focused on the right thing. 
Lord gave him a two-part answer. Part one, he gave him the Ten Commandments, a short version of it. Part two, he said, if you would be, here's the word he used, pay attention, perfect. Go, sell all you have, give it to the poor, come and follow me. See, you're lucky that you're negotiating with me and that I will accept a tithe as what your contribution is. Because if you were negotiating with the Lord, he just told you the number is 100%. To be perfect, to be on the journey that our Lord asked us to be, it's 100%. And so in another negotiation, our Lord sat down with Zacchaeus. Remember the tax collector? And at the end of that interaction, the tax collector said, Lord, I give 50% of what I have to the poor. And that used to bother me because I figured out, well, how come the rich young man had to give 100% and Zacchaeus got a 50% deal? And then I was at a Bible study where I learned you got to read the rest of the pass the gospel passage, and you see that that Zacchaeus agreed to return everything he had defrauded fourfold, and because he was a tax collector, he defrauded a lot of people, and that would be the other percent. See, our Lord said to be perfect, we are to truly give up everything and follow Him. So let's be honest, none of us are quite ready to do that, perhaps. So. What are some of the other problems that you have with the versions of dues that you have? Well, again, membership creates entitlements and expectations. Again, you start to think about it as being my money, kind of the old Burger King phenomenon, right? And that's not Christian stewardship. That's not what our Lord taught us. When, when we actually look at what it, the expectation is, we look for recognition. We think we have a right to determine how the spending takes place. We actually think that we can withhold our funds if the priest or the parish council president doesn't do and say exactly what we want. Now, just think for a second. What would happen if your creator did that to you? If every time you disappointed the Lord, if every time you didn't follow the clear instructions of our Lord and Savior, he said, you know what? I'm sorry, Steve. You were a little bad boy today. So I'm going to, let's see, let's take a lung and a, no, we, we, we don't, we want the freedom and the joy of the gift that God has given us. And ultimately, what we're called to do is share the first fruits, not what's left, the first fruits. And all these modified dues things are all what's left activities. Look at scripture. It couldn't be more clear in Luke 12, 48 where we're reminded that when we are given much, look at the word, it's underlined, it's in a different color, much is required of us. And the kind of lawyer loophole exception at the end, and by the way, if you've been getting even more, even more is expected of you. Scripture is always pointing us in this direction of, of not some random number that somebody picked by dividing a budget by the number of stewards, but by what have you been given? That's what you're called to do. That's what the first fruits are all about. Deuteronomy 16, 17, every person shall give as they are able according to the blessings your Lord, the, your Lord gave you. In other words, it's all about proportional giving. To the extent you've been given more, then you should give more. To the extent you haven't, that's fine. You should give what you are in proportion. So everything in scripture is pointing us in this percentage giving tithing direction. You will not find, and if you do, fact check me on this, call me out on it, Show me the scriptural reference where our Lord and Savior taught the do's or any of those modified crazy things that we've come up with. You're not going to find it. You're going to find clarity of percentage giving and tithing. So ultimately, the objective of what we're trying to get is to inspire, to motivate, to educate. Remember, we got educated how to pray, but ain't nobody educated us about how to tithe. So we've got to get into the education and communication business. But, but notice the subtlety of this that's not so subtle because I put it in red, so it will call your attention to it. This isn't just about giving us 10% of your income. That's the beginning. It's about giving us 10% of your time, 10% of your talents, and yes, 10% of your treasures. So you don't just to get a write a check away with this kind of thing. It is all about embracing this notion of gratitude in giving and, and giving of the gifts that you've been given. So I'm going to take you on a quick journey that proves my case that this isn't, this isn't something that Steve Pappas or Kristen Bruce, Kristen Metropolitan came up with, the Bill Marianas came up. This is, I'm going to build the case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as to why you must tithe or else. We're going to start all the way back from Leviticus. It could not be more clear that, listen to what they say, all, all the tithe of the land 
whether seed of the land or fruit or the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. The, the Lord gave us all of this. And, and so our tithe of the returning of that, which is what this whole first fruits concept came up, all the way back to the book of Leviticus. The Mac Daddy that everybody likes to quote is not from this produce store, but it, it, it's from Mac Malachi 3.10. Where, where, we're, where we are admonished to bring the tithe, that 10%, into the storehouse. And then listen to what they say afterwards. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much that you will have enough room for it. Now, I've got to put a parenthesis here. Sometimes prosperity gospel preachers, the kind of people that don't quite understand good Orthodox Christian theology, will use this to try and prompt you to say, and if you give your tithe, and if you can buy me a private airplane to take me from here and there, you'll get all these riches. That isn't what this is talking about. So don't get wrapped up in the, in the confusion of this. But it's very clear from Leviticus to Malachi that the principle of the tithe in the Old Testament was present. But if we, if we start to move it a little bit forward, and we look you know, into the third century, 230 A.D., we have the Didaskali, and the Didaskali, where, and you'll, you can see the footnote over there, it's kind of a Christian legal treatise that, that was belonging to the list of church orders, and it was, it, was, it, was, it, it was presented itself as being written by the 12 apostles during the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, there's clearly some disagreement, perhaps, as to its source of origin, but there's no theological disagreement with it. And in there, in the Didaskali, back in 230 AD, we see that we're admonished to set aside part offerings and tithes and first fruits to Christ, the true high priest and to his ministers, even tithes of salvation to him. So throughout the Old Testament, all the way up to right after our Lord's passing, we see it, but it gets added, it gets, it gets emphasized by the greatest lawyer that ever lived. And those of you who ever heard me talk before know that I always like to talk about the greatest lawyer that ever lived. Of course, I'm talking about St. John Chrysostom, just so that those of you that don't know, he was actually trained as a lawyer. As far as we know, he didn't practice law, but I, I like to quote him as the greatest lawyer that ever lived because at least one of us made it. Uh, anyway, to sainthood. So, but St. John Chrysostom, right, in, in, in the fourth century, was talking about the Old Testament. And he said, if there was a danger then in omitting the tithes, think how great it must be now. So St. John Chrysostom was reminding the faithful in the fourth century of the importance of continuing this notion of the tithes. And I'm telling you, if there, was a, if, there was a, if there was a danger in the fourth century in omitting the tithes, well, we've seen what's happened when we stop teaching and educating and communicating the tithe into our present church today. Those that like to quote the Old Testament and say, well, that was an Old Testament phenomenon, kind of skip over the Gospel of Matthew, at least two references where the Lord was talking about this whole notion of the tithe and how it applied. Now, one thing, frame of reference for, for those, if you're ever studying scripture, you always need to understand context because sometimes things don't make sense, right? So I kept reading the first one and I didn't quite understand what's this law and prophets thing. Well, that, those were the words they used for what we call the Old Testament, right? It was the, 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 the Judaic law that existed. And so if you were to just it, it's not a perfect uh, uh, example, but, it, but if, you, if you replace the word law and prophets with Old Testament, you'll kind of get the message here. And, and what he's saying, the Lord was saying, look, I didn't come to abolish the Old Testament, but I came to fulfill it. And then later on in, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 23, he makes it very clear. And I love the way he starts because, you know, nothing, nobody could mix it up like our Lord could. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Now, woe doesn't mean much to us. Woe was kind of a like, you know, a mamsy pamsy term. Back then, if you said woe to somebody, them's fighting words, okay? And then he, then he said, look, you, you tithe, but, but you've not focused on what he called the weightier matters of law, which were justice, mercy, and faith. But he ends it by saying, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. In other words, what he's saying is, we must continue these traditions of giving of our first fruits, giving sacrificially. That's, that's why I've been preaching about this. But justice, mercy, and faith are, are equally as important in this exercise. Okay, so if you don't believe Leviticus, if you don't believe Malachi, if you don't believe the Old Testament, if you don't believe the last if you don't believe St. John Chrysostom, if you don't believe our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'm calling out the final argument. This is the piece de resistance. You cannot argue with me on this. The tithe is actually laid out in the Uniform Parish Regulations. Dun, dun, dun. The highest authority in all of Orthodoxy, our UPR, 
actually calls us to tithe. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, from the Old Testament to just today, everybody is pointing us in the direction of percentage giving and tithing. But the messaging here that we're really trying to understand is that it's a minimum of 10% of our time, talents, and treasures. And the reason why I keep emphasizing minimum is because our Lord and Savior made it clear. Perfection in following him is defined by going all in, 100%. So I, as I, this is my best and final offer. I will not negotiate below 10%, okay? So just we're clear on this, right? That's, that's, that's what I want you to understand. But let's look at a little data. Y'all know me. You know that I, I like data because uh, I think it, 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 it and, and I give you the source down there, by the way. So I always invite people to, to fact check me over here. So that new agency or whatever it is that's going to do fact checking, have at it, ladies and gentlemen, I'm ready to go. So here's just a couple of data points that I wanted to share with you based on a proxy tithe analysis that I've done for over 275 parishes. In fact, that's why I was late on there. I was delivering one. The best guess, and it's a guess because y'all won't give me your tax return so I can actually see what percentage of your income you're giving to the church. The best guess is that across all of the GOA and some of the other Orthodox parishes, our people are giving between half a percent and seven tenths of a percent of our income. Now, just let that settle in for a second. If your faithful are giving half a percent and all they did was go up to 1%, you'd double your income in one year. And if the next year, all they did was not go to 10%, just go from 1% to 2%, you'd double your income yet again, right? So this is how easy that I think we have the opportunity. And all I'm telling you this data for is, remember I said, we were trained how to pray. Nobody prayed us how to tithe couple other data points, and this is one that I want you to take away from. Of those who tithe, and this is not GOA data, this is just general Christian data. Of those who tithe, 77% actually give more than 10%. They actually give more than 10%. So here's the beautiful thing. When you change the culture of your parish to being one that's focused on percentage giving on your way to being a tithing parish, you're not going to end up at 10%. It will continue to grow. And it's not because there's a gimmick involved. It's because people understand, they feel in their hearts the value of what happens when they become tithers. And they want that feeling. They want to help more people. Another piece of data point, because this I get this question all the time, is it based on gross or is it net? The answer is it's gross. Now, this is data from real giving. And 70% of the people that tithe actually do tithe based on their gross income. The reason why I say it's gross income is because what did scripture teach us? First fruits, not fruits that are left over after I do this and after I pay my taxes and after I do this and after mama eats and so, first fruits. And indeed, a vast majority of tithers actually understand that and practice it appropriately. And then finally, and one more data point to encourage you, the churches that accept tithing online have increased on their donations overall by 32%. So is it cause or is it effect? This is an effect. It's not the cause. The cause is that they understood the difference they're making in Christ's kingdom, the difference they're making in people's lives, the difference they're doing in making people better. The effect of that is they want to give more, so 10% doesn't become the top. They're on their journey towards 100%, which is what the Lord asked us, and they're clearly going to be far more generous than they ever were before. So one of the questions that I always ask every parish, now the number differs, and in a second I'll tell you which number is valuable for you, is what ministries, services, or charities would you fund if you had $2.5 million more than what you currently raise in stewardship, by the way, per year, not just once per year. Now, as I said, I'm a little bit late because I was working with a, a parish in, a, in another time zone. And I actually go through an exercise and I have a very precise number. And so I asked them to tell me what ministries and services and charities would they fund? And, and just so you know, I'm just proving this. I, I did it on the back of an envelope. That really is a, I mean, a back of a napkin. That really is a napkin. And I let them go for 15 minutes coming up with charities and ministries and services that they would do and ideas that they had and a homeless shelter that they would fund and a, and a, and a healthcare ministry that they wanted and some elderly ministries they wanted. I let them go for 15 minutes. At the end of 15 minutes, they had spent $1 million. That was it. Now, in their case, they had $1.9 million to spend. And after 15 minutes of 
And, and by the way, they would say, well, I need $70,000 for youth director. I said, I'm going to give you a hundred. Well, I need $75,000 for an elder. Now I'm going to give you a hundred. I was, I was grossing up all their numbers. Okay. So I want you to think for a second, just for one second in your own parish, what would you do? What ministries and services and charities would you fund if you had another $2.5 million? Can you think of a few things you would do? Can you think of a few things that would make a difference? Can you think of how you could be a better steward of God's gift in your community? I bet you can. Well, your number won't be exactly 2.5 million, but here's what your number will be. So we have taken the median annual income of Orthodox Christians from various countries of origin. It doesn't matter whether they're first, second, third, fourth generation. The data is listed below. Again, fact check me if you want to. This comes right from census data. This is the median annual income. Half make more, half make less. The median of the medians is 81,750. So the median income of Orthodox Christians, again, by the way, we're not including the converts because y'all are already tithing. So you're going to blow these numbers up the door, right? Median income is 81,750. If they all tithe, they would be given $8,175 to their parishes. Again, half make more and should give more, half make less and should give less, right? So if N is the number of stewardship units you have in your church, however many stewardship families or individuals you have in your church, if you will multiply N times $8,175, you will now know what your stewardship income budget will be. Well, I made it easy for you. I actually build a little chart here so you can actually fill in the gaps and you can kind of fill in the gaps if you're in between, right? So, you know, this parish that I was just talking to, you know, they, they, had, a, they had a little bit over 200 stewards and I told you their number was $1.9 million. And after 15 minutes, they couldn't possibly spend, they could only spend a million dollars of that. And, 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 and the difference they were gonna make in their community was extraordinary in that regard. So my brothers and sisters, I tell you this data to say the oldest joke in, the, in church stewardship, and this really is the oldest joke, is when the priest comes out in front of the congregation and he says, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we have all the money we need. The bad news is it's still in your pockets. My brothers and sisters, this is proof that we within the Orthodox ecosystem within the United States, by the grace of God, and make no mistake about it, it is God's grace that has afforded us the privilege and opportunity to be generous stewards. And so the question is how and what would you do with X million dollars more? So the question that everybody says, well, how do we get started with a tithing program, right? And the simple answer is, yeah, there's four steps. You have to teach it because remember what I said, we've been teaching prayer, we ain't been teaching tithing. You have to share the impact and the lives of proof. You have to lead by example, and then the technique we're going to talk about is the roundup. But ultimately, the only way it's going to happen is if you totally flip your parish culture and overcome generations of teaching deficiencies. Don't blame your parents or grandparents or my father was an immigrant to this country. I don't know where the, you are in the immigration cycle. They didn't understand it because nobody taught them that. You cannot give what you do not have. You cannot give what you do not have. So we've got to turn our culture over by educating and communicating. Let's take those four steps real quickly. The first step, teaching the tithe and percentage giving. You have to teach the why and the history of the tithe. Now, I've given you a drink of water through a fire hose in a very short, compressed period of time. This should be expanded out and repeated and told a lot of different ways. But there is not something that some church treasurer made up or much populismus made up or Steve Pappas dreamed up one day and whatnot. This is rooted in our orthodox theology. And we have to understand that. We also have to start teaching it at least monthly for a year. This is not going to, this is not going to be a one-time lesson that you get and you're done. At the end of this thing, you're not going to, well, I hope some of you will be, but it's going to take some reinforcing. And thirdly, it has to take multiple different formats. You have to use it in homilies, in articles, in Sunday school lessons, adult classes, stories. You have to have testimonials. We have to hit it from all different directions. And when you do that, when you start to see that, when people start to see that, and in a second you're going to hear from a parish that's done this, you'll see the benefit. But the first step is to overcome centuries, at least decades, of lack of education and conversation about tithing. We got to teach it. We got to preach it. Step number two. The key here is to share the impact and how lives are improved. 
How many of you get so excited when you get to sit down and pay your bills? You just can't wait. All day long, you've been waiting to sit down and pay your bills. Probably none of you. And if you do, there's a 12-step program for you, okay? What I'm telling you is, that is uninspiring. So telling people what the church budget is, when we've already established your budget was made up from last year's numbers anyway, uninspiring. But talk about how people's lives have been changed. Now that's inspiring. So give examples, concrete examples of how the impact of a tithe changed a person's life. Give actual stories of people that are helped and higher percentage of impact. When I'm at the podcast that I did on Ancient Faith Radio, I, I interviewed Father uh, Aaron Warwick from an Antiochian parish in Wichita who got a master's degree in, in studying on generosity. And he was kind enough to allow me to share his master's thesis. What the data shows is that when you're trying to inspire generosity, if you can put a person's name on it, you're going to get a much better result. If you say, let's help our kids. Eh, okay, let's help our kids. Let's help Stavrula. Stavrula needs that. Now, all of a sudden, it, it appeals at a different place in someone's brain and in their heart. Similarly, get, talking about the percentage of impact. In other words, if you can do a 10% impact, that's fine. If you can do an 80% impact, that's huge. It can be the exact same dollar amounts. So there's a lot of techniques, but it's all about sharing the story and the impact and, and, and paying budgets is not inspiring. And then here's a key. Folks, don't miss this one. Testimonials. And it's two types of testimonials. Testimonials from recipients and testimonial from tithers. Now, the second one's tricky because people who are tithers tend to be very humble about that and are not interested in standing up and talking about it, right? Except there are ways that they will talk about it, not in the context of look at how much money I gave or look how much time I gave or look how much of my talents I gave. But I, when I had the opportunity to do this ministry, to work with this person, to help this opportunity, to help that group, I can't tell you how great it made me feel and how much more of this I wanted. Testimonials are key. If you look over and over and over, how did Christ's ministry expand in the three years that we know about it? It expanded because he runs into a woman at the well, and that woman in the well is running into the town and running into the courtyard and telling everybody about it, right? We've got to share these opportunities, and nothing will be more impactful than when someone who has received the benefit of the tithe someone who's, whether it's a youth person, a homeless person, an older person, it doesn't matter. Let them tell their story. Make that connection in people's mind. Number three, sorry to say this, folks. Y'all need to lead by example. You need to lead by example. You, 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 you cannot talk it without walking it. So that means that, you know, this is the phrase I use all the time. Your actions speak so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. Don't tell me what I should do. Show me what I should do and walk, lead the walk. That means clergy parish councils, ministry leaders. You've got to show your commitment. You've got to prepare to stand up in front of everybody and say, either I am a tither or I am a percentage giver on my way to being a tither. There, there was a priest who, his parish was making the transition, becoming percentage giving parish on the way to being tithing. And he, he, his homily was, it was a mic drop moment. It was fantastic. He said, y'all, well, he didn't say y'all because he went from the South, but he said, y'all approve the salary. So you know what my, you know what my salary is? You now also know what my stewardship contribution is. It's just 10% of that number. I ask you to do the same thing. Drop the mic and walk away, right? Because his parish council, his leadership, his ministry said, we are all going to become percentage givers on the way to being tithing. And ultimately, ultimately, it needs to be a credentialing, not like we're keeping track of stuff like that, but if you want to be a, a member of the parish council or involved in the ministry, you can't not go to the divine liturgy and expect to be a leader of the parish. That just makes no sense. You just can't do that, right? Well, same with your generosity. You cannot be, you cannot be a, a, a dues kind of person and think that you have the right to lead others. We have to make this an imperative. Okay, technique. Here it is. Here's the challenge. I am challenging every one of you to do this, and then I'm done. I'm challenging you to do the round it. I mean, I'm serious. I, I really am begging you to do this tonight. Now, it's a little bit later on the East Coast than it is where y'all are, so you still got some time to do this, okay? Here's, what I, here's the way this works. Calculate. I want you to do this. I'm serious, folks. Last year, take how much you gave to your church and divide it by your gross income and calculate that percentage to one decimal point. Here's how much I gave to the church divided by my gross income 
and that's a percentage, and I want to calculate that to one decimal point. So let's pretend you're a typical Greek Orthodox Christian in America, and you gave half a percent of your income to the church. Okay, that's step one. Here's step two. This year, and only this year, so for 2022, to starting tomorrow, I want you to commit to round up your stewardship to your church to the next highest whole number in the level of giving. So if you gave half a percent last year, I want to ask you to only go to 1%, not 10, just go to 1%. If you gave 1.6% last year, I only want you to go to 2%. If you gave 3.4% last year, I only want you to go to 4% just for this year. And at the end of the year, see if you've starved or if you weren't able to take care of your family or just see if, if in some way unimaginable, unthinkable right now, your God who loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son will continue to bless you in ways where, well, that was kind of easy. So at the end of the year, you've rounded up to the next highest whole number. And assuming it works, then next year for 2023, just add one more percent. Just, just add one more percent. And you keep doing that year after year after year until you reach 10% or higher. Now, I will tell you what happens to people that use the roundup. And I know this because this ain't my first rodeo. Notice the little funny joke, roundup rodeo, see the little Gene Autry thing in the side. Man, I'm working hard here, folks. I mean, you know, anyway, all kidding aside. What happens is when people see the impact that they can have in the kingdom by the increase of their generosity, and they see how they feel and how, they, how, how much joy they get out of helping others, they'll go 1%, and then another percent, and then another percent, and they go, you know what, I can go 2, 3, 4, 5, and they hit 10, and it, it's a hockey stick. And oftentimes, it continues beyond that hockey stick. To When you've done the tithe, then you start to think, well, why am I not a, why am I not a double tither? I can be a double tither, or, or eventually you can be Rick Warren, Pastor Rick Warren from that church out your way. He's a reverse tither. He and his wife live off of 10%. They give 90% of the way. So that's what the roundup is all about. It's a simple gimmicky technique to start the education process that you did not get from your parents, your grandparents, your prior priest, whatever, whoever didn't give it to you, right? So we ended with a little bit of humor. I love this cartoon. This is the kid asking his dad, how come the waitress gets 15% and God only gets 10%? The reality is, let's be honest, we, we ethnic types, we orthodox types, we're better tippers and we're worse givers to the church. Here's our reality. How come the waitress gets 20% and God doesn't even get 1%? Now, I always try to provide as many different resources as I can. So I have a article that's on my website. You can get it. You can download it. You do not need to credit me with it. You can use it in your bulletin. It was a short piece that I wrote a long time ago when somebody came up to me at church and said, how much do I owe? And I realized, boy, do we have some teaching to do. And so I, it's available to you. There's a whole bunch of stewardship articles that you're free to use however you want to or not yet to. It's just a resource out there. I mentioned it earlier. I did a whole podcast on my Ancient Faith radio program with Nick Kessimiotis. It was February 6, 2019. So you can find these either by going to my website and scrolling down to February 6, 2019 podcast, or you can go to the Ancient Faith Radio site, the Stewardship Calling page, and scroll down to February 6, 2019. And Nick and I get into a lot of the details. All of this presentation, as I said, is already uploaded on my website. You can download it, take it home, give it to your grandkids for, for, uh, for uh, their post-pastal uh, gift. Uh, but, but, and, and it will be available to you on the Metropolis website. So here's the last thing I just want you to think about for a second. What would you do if you weren't afraid? What would you do if you weren't afraid? The truth of the matter is, if you weren't afraid of where's my next meal going to come from, or am I going to have enough money to retire, or is it, are we going to have enough money to cover this health care expense that I have, or am I going to have money to send my kids to school, or am I going to have enough resources to, you would be more generous because your creator created you that way. He created you to be generous. He gave you all of the, all of the hormones, right? And, 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 and so you are designed to be a generous, loving, caring feature. The only thing that's keeping you from being that kind of creature is we're a little bit afraid. 
And that means we, we just don't quite yet trust enough. You know, that it's said that the words fear not appear in the Holy Gospel 365 times. Now, isn't that interesting? How many days of the year are there? It's kind of like there's one fear not every day of the year. So I ask you to fear not. Don't worry about these things. I, I know I, I get it. I, we all do. It's just is what is. But I'm asking you to have faith and trust in the Lord who gave you everything and who merely asks that you return that gift, not to him. He doesn't need it. But, but you share your first fruits. And the way to do that is to forget about dollars amount. It's all about first fruit percentage giving, ultimately on your way to being a tither. And the roundup is a simple way to get you there. And that is all I have. Except to say, Christina, you still with us? Christina? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, you there? I know, Christina yeah. Mayhaus, May right? Right, Mayhaus. Oh, wrong one, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Like, I, I don't see know you, but... I, yeah, you're welcome <laughs> to talk too. But I, no. but I asked I ask Christina Mayhaus, who's been... Um, been, been working on this for a while to share a few real live hands-on experiences. Is that okay, Mr. Pappas? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So I am a parishioner at the Greek Orthodox Church of the Assumption in Seattle, Washington. And um, in the fall of 2020, our priest, Father Dean, who's with us tonight, um, formed a new stewardship committee. And the first thing that he asked us to do was to attend Bill's five-part seminar um, on the stewardship calling uh, program. And um, we, um, I think we had three people on the, four, four maybe including Father Dean, four people on our committee at that time. And um, when we got done with the fifth session, we met and uh, unanimously agreed that this was the direction that we needed to, to go, that we needed to implement Bill's program. Um, and we had asked Bill, you know, where do we start? And he gave us, well, he said he was going to give us three things, but he really, he gave us four things to, um, to work on from the beginning. And uh, one of them was uh, journeying to becoming a tithing parish through percent giving. Um, and so this was October, November of 2020, and we created our stewardship campaign materials uh, we asked everybody in our parish to uh, round up in 2021. Um, I personally, my husband and I, we rounded up that night when Bill told us, when he gave us the same challenge to round up our current pledge, we rounded up the next year, 2021. Um, we rounded up another percent um, and then another percent this year. So, um, and and I can tell you that it's had a tremendous impact on our parish. Uh, it has been transformational. Um, I, I think a lot of parishes uh, in 2020 probably experienced maybe an increase in stewardship as people um, recognized that the church wasn't going to have their festival um, or other fundraisers. And we too experienced an increase uh, in stewardship in 2020. Um, and in 2021, which is our first year of being a percent giving on our way to a tithing parish, um, our stewardship increased 25% last year. Um, more importantly, we're starting to see our median stewardship contribution. So that number where half the parishioners give less, half parishioners give more. Um, in years past, it had been $500 was our median. In 2021, it was uh, it went up to $600, and this year in 2022, so far we're at $1,000 is our mean stewardship contribution. Um, and again, uh, this year we are tracking about a 25% increase over uh, what was donated in 2021. Um, so I, I mean, I can tell you it works. <laughs> we don't have many problems anymore in our parish. We have um, committed to no longer relying on any fundraisers for our income. Um, in fact, we have a parking lot um, next to our church. We're in um, the metropolitan Seattle area, and we get income from that parking lot every month. 
uh, and beginning in 2022, we decided to donate that income. So in um, April and May of this year, all of our parking lot proceeds are supporting um, the IOCC's Ukraine initiative. And we have signs in our parking lot letting everybody know who's parking there that the proceeds are going to support um, people in Ukraine. Um, and I and I could go on and on, you know, for years we've been talking about the fact that we needed a second priest. Um, and as Bill had mentioned, we did our budget the old fashioned way, right? We looked at the prior year budget. We decided how much could we just punch it up a little <laughs> um, and then figure out what we want to do with that. For our 2022 budget, we didn't do that. We sat down, we figured out what do we want to do? What do we need to do? And that's what we budgeted for. So in 2022, for the first time, we're planning on hiring a full-time pastoral assistant. And we would not have been able to do that had we not um, jumped on the percentage giving um, to tithing bandwagon. Uh, and Father, if you have anything you wanna share, no, Christina, you're doing absolutely fantastic. Um, I just want to, sh uh, talking about thanking Kristen, um, what Christina just shared with you. you know, we have a really strong stewardship ministry, and thank you, Bill, uh, for your guidance. It's been a real blessing for our community. Uh, but I do have to say that we do have a strong stewardship team that has taken all this information that Bill's given us uh, and, you know, worked to implement it. And the foundation of that stewardship team, of course, uh, is here with us tonight. That's Christina and her husband, Gus. They've been truly a blessing uh, to our community and have really helped drive the stewardship program. Um, in fact, in fact, at the last um, stewardship committee meeting, you know, it's just, they're keeping me in, on, in track too, right? <laughs> Father, when's your next stewardship sermon, right? So, and that's a good thing. And I, and I welcome that because, you know, there's so many things going on. It's just so easy to forget but keeping the parish on track and even us as clergy on track, we're accountable to one another. And so that's a good thing. So I just wanna thank uh, you, Christina and, and Gus and our stewardship team of our community, uh, because without the, your efforts, um, we would not be involved in walking this journey in this transition. Can I just add one thing, Steve, before I leave it off to you? Sure. What, what what you've just heard, and I, I had no, I, I mean, I, I know the story that Christine and Father Dean have done, but I, I didn't know what she was going to say, and I we didn't vet it. it. We don't need to. We just don't need to. What you have seen demonstrated here is what can happen in your parish and in your life if you take our incredible theology regarding stewardship and you create a synviaconia, a partnership between your clergy and some lay leader. And I hate to say it, but it, you're better off you're better off getting a woman to do it than a man do it because men just mess stuff up. I just I'm just saying I don't know how why, but we aren't good at this stuff. But if you can create seriously, if you can create a Cynthia in the end, if you can get a few true understanding people that understand the theology and understand the discipleship and accept that call, accept that same call like the apostles did, and in partnership with their clergy, take these principles. I didn't create them, Steve didn't create them, Father Dean didn't create them, Christina didn't create them. They were given to us. That was another one of the gifts that we've received. And dedicate yourselves and work on. You can see the kind of results that they have seen at that blessed community. And that they're just beginning. When that pastoral assistant comes in, and now there's somebody else working up all day, every day working on this thing, and people see the benefit and the value and the service and the ministry and the I'm just telling you, this is, it's, it's contagious because God created it that way. So this is not a secret. This is not a trick. This is not a prosperity gospel. This is good, plain old, solid Orthodox theology and living the example that our Lord and Savior did with his apostles and his disciples. And, and you see it in Christina, you see it in the smile on her face and you see it in Father Dean's smile. And you, if you could see the people that have been benefited in their community, you'd see it in their smile too. This is what God can give you, but you got to make the commitment starting tonight to round up and to do the same thing in your parishes. Assumption has been just a beautiful story and being on this journey the last you know, several years uh, and Christina 
thank you again, and Father Dean. You you continue to inspire us and bring the story of Assumption in Seattle to to this group. Uh, so thank you, thank you for sharing there, Bill. We're we're a couple minutes past our designated time, but we do I'm have sorry. a couple questions. Oh yeah, that's I, fine. If if I can shoot them out there quickly. Um, Absolutely. I'm sorry. I apologize for going over. It. Steve, I, no, I, I, no, get, no. I get so excited hearing Christina and Father Dean talk, I just can't help myself. We, we got a couple questions from the, the group that have come in via chat. Um, okay. And around both percentage giving and, and tithing. Um, mm -hmm. So we talk about whether it's 10% or percentage giving. Um, mm -hmm. Does this include all charitable giving? Great so question. Whether, whether, is, you know, whether it's within the church itself IOCC or even right. outside of that. So that's question number one. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, it's funny because Nick Asmutis and I got the question. Some caller called in and we get the gross in that question and we get the 10% to the church or 10% for charity, right? And and his and my answer was the same. Our answer was yes. In other words, look, folks, you get the 10%. I'm not going to negotiate, right? The, the, the correct answer, I mean, if we go historically, Steve, the correct answer is there were actually two tithes. Back in, the, back in the ancient Jewish tradition and stuff like that. But in our understanding today, it's 10% to God's kingdom. When I talk about it in the context of tithing, I talk about it to God's kingdom. And of course, our parishes should be the, the first place where we think about God's kingdom being fulfilled, because indeed, that's where th they would bring the first fruits to the temple to their, to their thing. But in the, in the way generosity has worked in the orthosphere in America, we have incredible ministries like OS, IOCC, like OCMC, like OCPM, like OCF, right? So there's these other organizations that are doing wonderful, beautiful work. And so if you want to negotiate with me, I will allow you, as if I have any say, right? Yes, it includes all generosity and all and, and all of your giving. Great. But I'd thanks. still like to see temper, I'd still like to see 10% to the church. It's the extra part of the tie that can go to these other things, right? All right. And then we have another another question came in. Um, how can we teach tithing without seeming as if we're wanting money? Well, great question. And, and that's why, I, you know, look, that's why I had that slide at the very beginning. We've been teaching prayer. We ain't been teaching tithing, right? And so now it looks like it's a fire drill exercise, right? Like, oh, we're running out of money, so we need more money and stuff. So I go back and say, let's make sure everybody understands the theological foundation of tithing. Let's make sure we understand the theology of it. Number one. Number two, I talk about 10% of everything, time, talents, and treasures. So that it, so it, the, the, the analogy, I, not the, it's true actually, Steve, uh, back when I first made the commitment, like, you know, why am I not tithing? That's crazy. I need to tithe. Okay, great. So back when I was practicing law, we kept track of our time in six minute increments. That's the way big law firms bill in tenths of an hour. So I'd have to, at the end of the day, account for all of my time in tenths of an hour. And I decided, well, if I can do that for the amount that I'm charging clients, I can do that for my time to the church. And if I got to the end of the week and I looked at my time records and I had not given 10% of my time to Christ's church, then my tithe for that week was not complete. It just wasn't complete. And so, you know, as was mentioned earlier by Kristen and others, and, 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 and even Bill, when he talked about it, you know, this, this notion of when we give, the money follows because we, we see the need, we see the opportunity. So the answer is, no, it's not just 10% of your money. I mean, in other words, I don't give you credit as a tither if you write a check for 10% of your money. If you ain't given any of your time, if you ain't given any of your talents, if you are not invested in making a difference in the kingdom, it's a good start, but it's not enough. And so we have to teach it theologically. We have to understand what it means. We have to understand what the gift of first fruits was. We have to understand why they did that, why they fed other people, why we have to feed other people. And, 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 and then what happens is the emphasis comes off the money. That's why I say, don't talk about budgets. Don't talk about this. I mean, I really appreciate it. And I asked Christina to say, tell us what your results were. And she said, 25% increase, 25% increase. But when they talk internally, they don't talk about a percentage increase. They talk about the impact that they've had in their community, in their in their thing, and so it's not just about the money. Great, thanks, thanks, Bill. Um, I know again we're running uh, late and want to be respectful of everyone's time. 
before we close out, any other questions from the group here, if you wanted to come off of mute, otherwise we will have our closing prayer. Any additional questions for Bill, for Kristen? Okay, well. I know, we Steve, I'm sorry. I, I don't, I just have a, a comment to make and that is, um, I think it's important um, and any parish that wants to walk this journey that Bill's presentations are taken and reviewed every once in a while. Um, I say that I'm kind of reflecting kind of in my own journey because Christina said it. You know, she talked about increase, increasing her giving by 1%. And thank you, Bill, for the reminder, because I think it's really important. And again, this is where we have to kind of keep reminding ourselves and working together as a, as a team in that way. Yes, I've increased my giving by a percentage point this year and the previous year, but I have not we have not shared that with the parish. So Bill, your presentation tonight has helped remind me of that. And Christina, thank you for helping remind me of that too. <laughs> um, because I think I think that's really important. So to continually every once in a while review the, the, the program, I think is important because important aspects of it um, can maybe get lost or fall through the cracks as you're walking the journey. Yeah, that's that's be, all, also what I wanted to say. Be a witness, that's beautiful. Uh, thanks for the reminder, Father Dean. Uh, you know, Bill has left us with so many resources and so many things that uh, you know. Occasionally, really, I mean, going back and and reviewing the the resources, the information is so helpful. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening, and we certainly welcome you know the questions. Uh, we are going to reconvene in a couple of weeks, and Dr. Eve Tibbs uh, will will talk about. Um, fostering a culture of lifelong Christian learning. Um, so the Christian learning across all of the, uh, all of our lives uh, throughout our lifetime. So looking forward to that. Um, Father Timothy, if yes. you can bless us with a closing prayer. Sure. Let me, let me just say, Bill, uh, thank you uh, for the presentation. It's good to see you again. It's been a few years. Uh, Kristen, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was beautiful. And Christina, it's good to see you uh, up in Seattle again. Um, you know, I just want to offer a, a 30 second comment too. Um, you know, they say that punishment is the least effective way to change behavior. Uh, but encouragement is the strongest way. And I think what Kristen had to say in terms of the thank yous uh, is vitally, vitally important. And I also think what Bill was alluding to and talking about in terms of showing, um, acknowledging the, the difference that people make in a parish and highlighting that is going to be way more effective. I, I think that when we start hearing increases in number and, and not being so uh, burdened by debt and bills and all that, when we start thinking about increasing money, that's probably something that really lights us up because we've been so tired of it, you know, but I hope that it, it, it's not going to stay there. I hope that when we start seeing the change in people's heart, the transformation that takes place in lives, that that's what's going to light people up. And the money is just something that's off to the side. And it, it really is sort of irrelevant in many ways if we're just giving as we're supposed to give. But the joy is going to come from not being in debt. The joy is going to come from what we're, you know, what we're experiencing in the life of the church. So I want to thank all of our presenters for that. Okay, let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, we will never be able to give enough thanks to you for all that you have blessed us with. In fact, for our very lives that we live, that we can breathe, that our heart beats every single day, that you are the sustainer of our life. We pray and ask you, O Lord, through your Holy Spirit, who operates and functions in the church to continue the blessings from above, that all of our hearts and minds will be transformed, that we will embrace this, the gifts you have given us and to take all that you have given us and to offer back to you only that which is yours. We ask that you guide us in the process, that we become good educators, that the hearts and minds of all the people in our church will be enlightened, that they will come to see the goodness of your mercy and love and for all the things that you give to us every single day so that we may give back just a small percentage of our life and all that we've been given to glorify your name, to further your kingdom on earth. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Kristen and Bill.